Hi, I'm Eli. I'm one of your TechSoup Connect hosts, and we're all a program of TechSoup. TechSoup is actually a nonprofit that helps other nonprofits get, implement, and use technology. So if you're a nonprofit, charity, church, or library, you want to start with TechSoup anytime you need hardware, software, services around using technology is within your nonprofit. And what TechSoup is best known for is being the place where you can go for discounted and donated services from about 120 major technology companies. Everything from Zoom to Google to Microsoft to Intuit to Zet Dell to GrantStation to Adobe. So if you have a software request, start with TechSoup, create your free account, and see if there's something there in the catalog that would be a good fit for you. Today is the fundraising drivers that will raise you more. And I'm delighted that we have a repeat guest presenter with Rebecca Alfred from Trellis Social Enterprise. So Rebecca is part of the team at Trellis, supporting charitable organizations, hospital foundations, nonprofits, and others who want to find new approaches to raising funds for their cause. Rebecca comes with a diverse background, including technology, marketing agencies, accounting firms, but now she is rock solid in the social sector. Rebecca started at Trellis and has supported hundreds of organizations as they run fundraisers with specialized expertise in signature fundraising events, the donor experience, and hybrid fundraising. So please join me in adding some clappy emojis to the chat and welcome Rebecca. Okay, before we get started, I want to see a quick hand raise emoji in the chat. How many of you have ever spent way too long planning a fundraising event for your organization? Okay. Yes, I'm seeing some of those hands pop in here. Absolutely. Okay, and then another one. How many of you, even after spending all of that time, didn't quite get the return on investment that you were anticipating? Show me a little emoji. Show me a little yes, no, something. Yeah, I'm seeing some more hands go up. A little sad face. Absolutely. You know what? First, if you take a look at that chat, just know you're in good company. But you know what? Honestly, that's pretty similar with what we're seeing from a lot of different organizations as we're connecting with them and understanding a little bit more about what fundraising looks like and how you can raise more for your organization. So with that in mind and seeing those emojis continue to come in, I'm going to make all of you a promise. By the time that this session ends, I'm guaranteeing that you're going to write down at least three notes from my talk. And if you don't, I need you to tell me in our Q&A period at the end, and I'm just going to keep throwing more and more insights at you until you've all got at least three notes written down. Okay, a little bit nervous about that promise I just made, but actually hold me accountable. You've all chosen to spend the next hour with me. While I know that all of you had so many other things you could be doing, or you could be catching up on that never-ending work to-do list. So it is my goal to make this next hour so valuable for you and prove to you that you need to take this new fundraising insight I'm about to share with you seriously. And not only that, but I'm going to give you some more actionable steps that you can take to actually implement into your organization. Now, unlike most sessions, you wait until the very end to hear this big breakthrough data that we found. So we're just going to start with it instead. We conducted a survey with over 1,000 organizations and at, with every additional fundraising driver that those organizations added, the amount that they raised doubled. Think about that. Consistently, the amount that people kept raising was increasing. And again, this wasn't just one or two organizations. This appeared with over 1,000 fundraisers. Now, what do your fundraisers currently look like and how can you steal this model? Now, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about this and hopefully sharing more ideas to convince you that this is the way to go. But before we get there, I wanted to share one quick story about just one of those 1,000 fundraisers. St. Michael's Hospital Foundation ran a fundraiser with us in the fall of 2020. It was their first time going virtual and it turned out to be They raised just over $50,000. They had virtual event tickets for donors to buy and offered a silent auction online that people could participate in. But as they thought about that same fundraiser again in 2021, they knew they could do better. And as the world continued to change, they needed to increase the amount they were raising in order to still support so many people. 
And so they went back to the drawing board and started by looking at the fundraising drivers they had used and how they were going to use them differently to hit their goals. For the first time ever, they decided to increase the amount of ways they were giving their donors to engage. They offered tickets, but included a meal option as add-ons to engage more people and raise more money. They added in a golden ticket item. It was a mystery box filled with tons of different items that were going to create a VIP experience for virtual attendees. They added their their auction, but they encouraged their donors to use the auto bid feature to raise more and save donors time. Then they added in a 50-50, which built hype leading up to the event. And then on the night of, they continued to promote it, growing the size of their pot and encouraging their new donors to keep giving in a brand new way for their organization. And beyond all of that, they chose to donation augment their event. With every type of purchase made, donors were asked if they would like to include an additional donation. It was a simple ask when donors were already checking out, which made it really simple and easy for them to give and continue supporting the organization in a tangible way. And it worked. They raised more than double what they had in the year past, raising $108,000. It was more than their ever raised in this fall event in the past. And it all came down to the diversity of ways they gave their donors to participate. Now, why am I telling you this? I want you to know that if you're new to fundraising or if you've been doing this for years like St. Michael's, If you're a small organization or a large team, there will be a key takeaway for all of you in this session. From multi-person fundraising teams to single RAND person organizations, we're seeing organizations take the tactics that I'm about to share and change the way that they're approaching their fundraising goals. And I want to do the same for you. So here's where we're going to go. Let's briefly review each of our fundraising drivers. Let's talk about how they can each help you hit your fundraising goals and some tactics to raise more through each one. Then let's revisit that chart I shared at the beginning and talk about the impact for your organization when we put them all together. Throughout this session, I'm also going to share some real-life examples and ideas from organizations that have. My goal for the end of our time here is that you all walk away with some clear next steps on how you can raise more for your organization than you have in the past. In addition to all of that, we put together a guide which provides more details on everything I'm going to be sharing in this talk. You can scan the QR code on the screen here and you can find it. Or Zoe from the Trellis team is also going to throw it in the chat right now for you to find as well. I like to think of this talk like step one and then the guide like step two. We cover the same insights in the guide and in the talk, but in the guide, we go into way more detail. We get into the data and some quick ideas that you can implement into your fundraiser. And in this guide, we've even put together a one-pager specifically designed for your key board members, stakeholders, and other team members so that they can get just as excited as you will be by the time that this talk is done. So again, I encourage you to scan the QR code or find that link and you can download this guide right now. We'll also be ending our session with some Q&A. So if you have any questions while I'm talking, Make sure you throw them in the chat. Zoe's going to be answering some of those questions right away, or we'll be holding some of them and doing them with our live Q&A. So keep the chat flowing. Make sure you got all your questions in there. But before we get into it, first, a little bit about who we are. We're from Prelis. We are a fundraising platform that helps organizations with events ranging from galas and golf tournaments and campaigns like raffles and 50-50s and auctions. And we work exclusively with charities and nonprofits. We build fundraising software to help charities host all of their fundraising elements in one place for their events and campaigns to improve the donor experience. We help charities raise more and save time. Hundreds of charities have run fundraisers on Trellis, and we have learned a ton from their successes and failures. So I'll be sharing with you some of my favorite tips and tricks to make your next fundraiser. I'm Rebecca. My pronouns are she, her, and Zoe from our team is also in the chat today with us as well. We're both joining from the Silks Nation, also known as Kelowna, BC. We wanted to take a moment here to just pause and reflect on the different lands that each of us get to come from. Okay, let's jump into it. First, let's talk about this idea of donation augmented fundraising. Now, some of you might be sitting there wondering, what does that even mean? Don't worry, I've got you covered. Donation augmented fundraising is the strategic approach 
of asking for, do uh, for donations from your guests at the correct moments to encourage more giving and specifically using those unrestricted funds to support your organization. When presented the right way, donation augmented fundraising has the potential to help you raise 20% more for your organization. Don't worry, we're going to keep talking about this concept throughout our session. And as we talk about some of these different fundraising drivers, donation augmented fundraising will come up again. But I wanted to start here so you can keep it in the back of your mind as you think about how the insights I'm sharing with you are going to impact your organization. So first up is event ticketing. Tickets are usually the first fundraising driver you think about when planning your events. We reviewed the research and the first thing that came to mind when we took a look at the research was that 20% of all funds raised in the study we conducted came from event ticketing. And in our survey, we also found that most organizations don't spend that much strategizing or thinking about this specific fundraising driver when they're getting it set up. So when you don't spend that much time on it, but it has the potential to bring in 20% of your funds raised, I think that's a clue that we need to give it a little bit more time and attention. When we look at this fundraising driver on its own, the first opportunity we see organizations often overlook is charging for all tickets, all the tickets for their events. Not only does it secure commitment, but it is a great way to increase the amount that you're able to raise. The next big opportunity with tickets is to charge at different price points. Offer sponsorship options, table tickets, or tickets that have a tax receivable portion back to the donor without spending back to their donor. Without spending more time, Small ways have a really big impact and can help increase the amount that your organization can raise through ticket sales. One of the organizations we're supporting at Trellis right now just set up what they called an impact ticket. It's the exact same as a regular ticket, except for it has a higher price point. Those extra dollars are going directly to making donations for their organization. It's really clear and simple for their donors. They understand the impact that buying an impact table can make, or ticket can make versus a regular ticket, and they also get a tax receipt, which helps provide more value for your donors. So now that we've dug into the ticketing portion of your fundraiser, let's move on to the next part. But before we do that, again, if you have any questions at all, now is a great time to throw them into the chat. We will be answering those questions at the end, and so we may get to some answers right away as we go here as well. And while we're there, next stop is going to be in our study, we found that 40% of all funds raised came from auctions and loan. And honestly, we weren't really that surprised. They truly are a cornerstone to fundraising. We also found that according to our survey, organizations invested on average the most amount of time towards this specific fundraising element compared to any other one. But the payoff was also there. With auctions alone, organizations were typically raising around $14,000 compared to every other fundraising driver, which when done alone was bringing in between two to $8,000. Now, don't get me started what happens when we donation augment our auctions as well, but we're going to save that for another time. So there is still a case for auctions and it's still worthwhile to keep doing them as they bring in on average $14,000. But how can you do them better while not adding more time? Here are two quick ideas for your silent auctions. The first is to automate donor notifications. Throughout fundra your fundraiser, notify donors when they are outbid and give them easy options to keep rebidding or notify them right before the auction ends. Those simple texts or emails will keep your donors engaged and raising platform that does that for you it's gonna save you time without you having to worry about another thing. Another thing we're really excited about is this idea of both further donation augmenting your auction bids. Imagine what would happen if with every donation or every bid that's made that doesn't win the auction item, your donors get a text notification asking them if they would like to change that bid into a donation instead. Seeing as they were already planning on giving that amount, this ask should be simple and the results should be amazing. Now for live auctions, there is also a lot of potential to use those to raise more for your organization too. We've supported an organization that used what they called the mystery item and it worked so well that I have to share it with everybody I talk to. Here's how it works. You announce your first live auction item, which is a mystery item. 
Maybe it's a bottle of wine or a box of chocolates. And your auctioneer kicks off the bidding really low. Maybe it's only one or Now use this to focus on getting your donors engaged. And as when your donors are more engaged and the price is low, it's easier for them to feel the excitement and hype and want to keep bidding to get that number higher. Don't let your guests know what this item is. And when the bidding kind of starts to slow down, you can reveal what this grand item is and announce the winner. The point of the mystery item is not to raise more money for your live auction. It's actually just to get your donors engaged. Once they've had that excitement and engagement around your first mystery item, you can get into your real live auction items, and we guarantee you're going to see more engaged bidders for your organization. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, how much time and work goes into putting in an auction. By far, out of all of the fundraising drivers, it has the biggest time investment. However, these ideas I shared actually don't really cost you any more. Auto bidding, text notifications, and asking to turn bids into donations should all be included in the fundraising platform you choose. And actually, if anything, they should reduce the amount of time you have to spend on engagement throughout your auction. And live auction mystery items shouldn't be a challenge to come up with. Again, it should be something easy like a box of chocolates or a bottle of wine. But it's a really easy way to drive more engagement with the ultimate outcome of still raising more for your organization. Let's move on to our next one, which is this whole idea of e-commerce or items for sale. And again, if you have any questions or thoughts or additional ideas around how you can raise more for auctions that you want to share with the group, now is a great time to throw it into the chat. But as we jump into e-commerce, or as we like to call it, items for sale, I have to be honest with you all. Fundraisers that are just selling items don't generally raise enough to warrant the effort that you're going to put in. But before you completely disregard them and ignore everything I'm about to say, let's also remember that they are the most versatile and perfect add-on ever. And again, if we just remember that chart I shared at the very beginning, what we found was that organizations that added any additional fundraising driver to their organization or to their fundraiser, they raised double the amount that they had in the past. So if you're still thinking that items for sale does not apply for you, hang on just one second. This could be the secret to raising double what you had done in the past. Add-ons can literally be anything with items for sale. Some of the favorite ways that I've seen organizations make the most of this are for their galas. Maybe you're selling drink tickets or a swag bag like St. Michael's did. Or this is a cool one. An organization set up add-ons with voting options for their gala. They ask donors to vote on what songs they'd like to hear the entertainers play throughout the night. Or what about your golf tournament? Maybe you do an add-on of mulligans that people can buy to use as needed throughout their game. If you noticed with those last two, both voting options and mulligan tickets, they don't cost a single cent to your organization, but they still have the opportunity to engage your donors in new ways and encourage them to keep participating and giving leading up to and during your event. And even with small purchases that might also be a couple of dollars, you can still use that to hit your fundraising goals. Now, I mentioned it a few times, but I would highly encourage all of you to take a second now to quickly download our resource guide. And again, Zoe, if you wouldn't mind throwing it into the chat, that would be awesome. We've got lots more research to support why you should include small additional add-on elements to your next fundraiser. And we've got some more ideas too to help you actually take those and put them into action. So let's take a quick pause here for a second so you can all grab the guide. Okay, we have just passed the half to our fundraising drivers. How is everyone doing? Are we ready to jump into the last team? Amazing. Okay. And again, if you've got any questions, keep them coming, throw them in the chat. I definitely will be answering all of them in our Q&A at the end. And so I would love to hear what those questions are from you. at this. So first up, we're going to talk about raffles. We love raffles and we are seeing organizations raising so much more than they have in the past because of a new approach to raffles that's just starting to take off. Sophisticated organizations are now encouraging donors to make donations with their raffle purchase, and the results so far have been amazing. For organizations that ran a fundraiser with a raffle and donations, 80% of funds came from their raffle tickets, and about 20% of funds came from the donations that were made. 
Sounds pretty good, hey? This quick addition made a massive impact. And not only did it help identify new donors be reaching out to, that 20% went above and beyond to give. That 20% they gave up above and beyond to give became the focus for fundraisers to engage and educate about their cause. But maybe so we can truly see the impact from a dollar's perspective, let's think through a hypothetical 50-50 that we're all going to run together. Now, I'm not great at math, so let's make this simple. Let's say that your 50-50 raised $10,000. Now, for a 50-50, 50% of those raffle dollars raised will go to the winner. In this case, that would be $5,000. And let's say that you're going to pay 10% in fees, which would be 1000 bucks. So now your organization is left with $4,000 in raffle funds going to your organization. Now, let's not stop here with this hypothetical 50-50. We did some digging and found this. In some provinces across Canada, there are specific rules around how funds raised through raffles are used, which further restrict organizations around how they spend those dollars. So again, of that $10,000 raised in a 50-50, the $4,000 that you receive is restricted. But remember that I said that modern organizations are donation uh, augmenting their raffles? So what if for our hypothetical 50-50, we also raised an extra 20% on top of our raffle sales? That would be another $2,000 raised for your cause. This money isn't part of the raffle. So it is separate from the, and not only separate from the total raised, it's also unrestricted, giving more flexibility around how and where you use it within your organization. However, before we get too excited, we're discovering not that many organizations are taking this new approach to raffles just yet. So use this insider knowledge to your benefit and trust me, be the first ones to jump on this trend. Now, taking it back to your organization specifically, I want you to think through how you would start to run a donation augmented raffle for your organization. First, you're probably going to have a conversation with your board. And before today, it probably would have went something like this. You would have said, we've got an upcoming raffle and we're expecting to raise about $10,000, which will result in 4,000 restricted funds for our organization. And then you would have walked them through the raffle process. You would have talked about being approved as an organization to hold raffles, then getting a license for this particular raffle, then setting it up to comply with raffle rules, supporting your donors through it all. And after all of that, somehow figuring out how to do a random number generated draw as well. Now, it's going to be a completely different conversation now that you've attended this session today. What if you walked in to have that conversation with your team and instead you handed them the board one pager from inside your guide and said, we're going to do a raffle. It's going to raise $10,000. 4000 of that will be in restricted funds, but we're also anticipating to raise an extra $2,000 that we, that we can use as unrestricted funds for our organization wherever we see fit. Now, I don't know your board, but I imagine that conversation and their willingness to participate is going to be significantly, significantly higher after that second conversation. So while we love raffles and we think they are a fantastic way to build excitement and awareness around your organization and raise some funds, let's also take off our rose-colored glasses for just a second. When you raise $10,000 in your raffle, you desperately need that extra $2,000 in unrestricted funds to come anywhere close to justifying the expense and the amount of work that your team went through to coordinate a raffle. And while raffles are great, the only way you should be doing them is by also offering a donation augmented approach. If we go back to our study for just a second, this is what we found. Organizations that did just a raffle raised on average $4,000. And organizations that did a raffle with donations raised on average $33,000. Now, I'm not trying to pretend that just adding a donation is going to suddenly raise $29,000 more for your organization. But what this does tell me is are raising more with this new approach. And the organizations that are more sophisticated are using this approach and it's working. Okay, on to our last fundraising driver, donations. Okay, just a heads up, I'm not done with this whole restricted, unrestricted funds idea just yet. In fact, I actually want to dive in here. We found a study conducted by Imagine Canada that stated that $11.9 billion given at the start of the pandemic, only 3% of that was unrestricted. 
Wow. When I read that, I was shocked. Only 3%. Now, don't get me wrong. Restricted and unrestricted funds are both necessary for your organizational success. But a key to hitting your goals, keeping the lights on, and advancing your organization is undoubtedly having funds that you can use as you see fit. As the leaders of your organization, you know the needs and the costs to implement different initiatives or simply support your operational costs in a positive way. And so having funds that you can use based on urgency or need is critical. Now, as you can tell, I was and still am pretty shocked when I think about that stat. So I decided to do some talking with some other fundraising professionals and see what they had to say too. Some of the conversations at Sparks were really insightful for me. One person said that, in a word, restricted funds are a headache. They shared that some organizations would even pass up on restricted funds if the return was low. And my guess is that all of you here today have or would also pass up on restricted funds given the right circumstances. Maybe you saw a particular grant, but it wasn't actually going to work because the amount you received wasn't quite enough for what you needed. Or maybe you didn't have the right program to meet those needs specifically. Or maybe you had the perfect program, but the time frame was too tight and you couldn't afford to sit around and wait for months or even a year to hear a result. Or maybe you actually just needed the funds to be put towards operations, staffing costs, or training, which restricted funds often don't cover. I spoke with Elaine the Auctionista as well, who clearly knows a thing or two about fundraising. They also gave me some really great insight. They mentioned that as an auctioneer that supports a lot of larger hospitals and foundations, the conversation around unrestricted funds comes up often, especially in the height of the pandemic. It was a hot topic. Lane noted that during the pandemic, to step up their giving and not necessarily support a new program, equipment, or capital project, but simply give where is needed within the organization These donors didn't back down. Instead, they went above and beyond to support their beloved organizations. They understood that the greatest need and the greatest need for that organization, and they went after that. I was so encouraged. Even when the systems and grants don't always align with the support we need and how we need it, our donors understand and will step up to the plate. And they gave because they believe in our organizations. They believe that your organization matters, not because they necessarily like where the funds are being directed. So now bringing it back to your organization and your fundraising, the idea of unrestricted funds that your organization can use as needed looks even better. And if we consider that with all of these fundraising drivers, tickets, silent auctions, live auctions, items for sale, raffles, the additional amount don- organizations raised as using a donation augmented approach allowed them to raise on average 20% more. Simply put, it would be a mistake for you to pass up on this opportunity. And what gets me the most excited is that these are results from over 1,000 fundraisers, not just a couple. So it's clear to me that with a single addition to your fundraiser, you will see a notable increase. And I should also mention This shouldn't be a large, overwhelming task to add in donations. If you can spend 10 minutes to clearly define why giving is important, then suggest some donation amounts and include an engaging image, you should have everything you need to grow your fundraisers. Our survey indicated that the majority of organizations believe that the fundraising driver with the highest return on investment for their organization is donations, and we think they're onto something for sure. Now, we've just covered the six fundraising drivers, some data around each one, and ideas around how you can increase the amount that you can raise with each one. But before we end here, I wanted to take it back to the very beginning. For this chart with you, we know each fundraising driver has potential and can help you bring in more dollars for your organization. But the biggest factor that led to raising more wasn't what you used, but how many fundraising drivers from two to three to four, the amount raised doubled each time. Okay, I'm supposed to be wrapping this up, but I wanted to sneak in just a couple more ideas that you can implement into your charity based on what we've seen other organizations do. One of the organizations we work with recently decided to try doing a bundle. 
they decided to take this idea of selling more fundraising drivers to the next level and they really ran with it. The organization was selling tickets, raffle tickets, donations, and items with. So, four of the fundraising drivers, which we love, but they also created packages, or as we like to call them, bundles. Their bundles were made up of a combination of all these different fundraising elements that could be sold. And what we love about it is they were able to encourage some of their donors to buy items they typically wouldn't. And they also received a tax receivable donation as well, which donors love and allowed organizations to raise more. As you think about your organization, are there any bundles that you could create for your next fundraiser? Maybe we use this for your gala. What if we were to create a bundle with a gala ticket, tickets for a wine wall, and a raffle ticket for guests with a donation included? your donors will be purchasing, but you've now made it easier for them to participate while increasing the average transaction size. And again, you may be able to encourage people that don't typically buy a raffle ticket or ticket for the wine wall to also purchase those for the first time. So now where does that leave us today? I have just spent the last 38 minutes trying to explain to you and honestly trying to convince you that you need to be incorporating these different fundraising drivers and using them strategically in a way that's going to allow you to hit your fundraising goals. And on top of all of that, we've talked a lot about donations, how you can use donations more strategically with a donation augmented approach to fundraising so that you can raise more and so that you can do it without having to put more effort into your fundraisers, which I know sounds like an absolute dream. But as you think about all of, the, all of this, the first question popping into your mind right now is how. And while we don't have enough time to really dive into that, our guide really does. And again, if you have it, I'm sure you're going to find some more ideas and tactics you can implement right away once you've downloaded it. Again, Zoe, if you wouldn't mind throwing into the chat, that would be amazing. But I know that was a little bit like drinking out of a fire hose. And my goal for you at the end of this session was to leave you with some actionable steps. So before we end here and move to our Q&A, let's maybe identify three different buckets and figure out which one you may fit into. So maybe you've already got a fundraiser going or up and running. If that's you, that's awesome. Make sure that you read through the guide that we shared to see what other ideas you can implement right away that's going to help you raise more money for this fundraiser that you've got active. Or maybe you're due a conversation with your board or your, or your boss, and now you have some more evidence to share on, around why Donation Augmented is the best way forward for your fundraising. Again, we've created something special for this group. If you're in our guide, you'll find our board one pager, and it's designed to highlight all of the elements of this talk in one single place so that you can share it with them and it help encourage them to understand the potential of that left 20% more that you could be raising for your organization. Or number three, maybe you're ready to take the steps that we just shared and implement them into your organization right away. At Trellis, we helped charities raise more with, their ta with these tactics and while we'd love to chat, the goal is that in this guide, you find next steps to raise more. But of course, if you would like to connect with our team, we would love to do that too. I would recommend connecting with one of our fundraising experts. And we've got, we've supported hundreds of different organizations. And so we've seen firsthand what they can do and what you can do that's going to help you raise more money. I'm going to throw up some contact details in just a second here. But before I do that, I want to just make sure we open up the floor to questions one more time. So throw them in the chat. And also, at the same time, let me know if you wrote down three notes in your notebook. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to invite Zoe. Oh, looks like you're already off mute. Amazing. <laughs> hey, everyone. I'm Zoe from the Trellis team, Rebecca's colleague. I'm going to be kicking off some Q&A. So we'll start with some questions. But keep in mind as we're answering these, putting your questions in the chat, and we'll power through as many as that we can. So Rebecca, I'll start with the first question. You mentioned using the e-commerce or items for sale feature for mulligans or voting options. Could you expand on some other ways to utilize this feature to help organizations raise more? Yeah, absolutely. I love the concept and the idea of doing like add-ons with with your fundraiser. Like Zoe said, we've seen organizations use the add-ons to do like a mulligan ticket or hole in one contest or a putting contest or golf tournaments. Any of those like the little extras that you have beyond like people playing golf are really great. Thing that we can ask people to give to participate in. 
And if so, what would that look like? And then as you think about your gala, I would think about what are, again, the same kind of things where we can do a little add-on or another way to engage. So maybe you have a photo booth. Then instead of letting everybody use the photo booth, it's a $2 charge to take their pictures in this photo booth. Or maybe we're doing a drink ticket. We're actually seeing a lot of organizations try something like the wine wall right now where you have 25 bottles of wine on the wall and people can buy a ticket, same price for all tickets, and maybe it's five or 10 bucks. And then they get one of those. They don't know what bottle they're going to get. It could be a $20 bottle or it could be a $200 bottle. A $200 bottle. But again, it's just like a fun way to engage people, get them to participate, maybe in ways that they haven't before. So I would try some things like that. Swag bags we're seeing. I've seen some organizations that are just selling t-shirts. Maybe you bought t-shirts at one point for the organization and you've still got a few kicking around the office. Throw them into a different race there as another to give. I love those ideas. They're just so simple and just add on to easily raise more. We had some questions come in from Eli here, so I'll start with those. For You mentioned we had that board one pager in the guide. How would you suggest starting the conversation of adopting new drivers with change adverse boss? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. That is a, a problem that many people have faced before. So first of all, know that you're not alone. And second, I would say I would always encourage people to start with the data to say, you know what, these are the organizations that we're seeing that are taking this approach. And this is the impact that they've seen. Organization X down the street in the past, they had only ever done a silent auction with their event. Last year, they added in a raffle and I heard that their team added an additional $20,000 for their organization. Whatever that looks like, starting with that data can help really inspire your boss to feel like, hey, it's possible for other people and it can be possible for us. The second thing I would say is talk to your boss around not necessarily which fundraising drivers you do, but the point of adding more fundraising drivers, which at the end of the day is to help you raise more money. Raising more money is super important for your organization. So leaning into that is going to be a great win. And then the third of all, I would say, look for the fundraising drivers, which are going to be the easiest to add in. At this point, the one that's going to be the easiest for your organization to include right away is going to be a donation upsell. It's going to take you less than 10 minutes, and it's going to allow you to easily raise more for your organization. So start with that. It's low effort, but very high impact for your organization and work towards adding more and more fundraising drivers each. Amazing. And we'll just address Brenda's question here. I saw Eli sent our website page with our features, but Rebecca, how would you just describe Trellis as a service? Just type the words. Yeah. So we're a fundraising platform. So charities will use our platform to raise more for their organization. Maybe they're selling tickets, doing donations or donation campaign. You can host raffles or 50-50s on Trellis, as well as run silent and live auctions on our platform as well. Our goal with Trellis is to for you to engage all of your donors in the different ways that you do fundraising in one single page. So instead of having donors go somewhere for tickets, somewhere for a silent auction, and somewhere totally different for a raffle, you can do all of it on Trellis, which is going to give your donors a better experience, but ultimately help you raise more because you can add in different elements like the donation ups. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. So yeah, you talked about those bundles and you finished with that. And I think that's a great idea. How do you start thinking about the right mix for your organization? What do you put in those bundles? This is going to sound like a really big cop-out answer, but I'm going to say it really depends. It really depends on where you typically see or individuals participating in the different elements of your fundraiser as it stands. So if you find that actually not that many people have been purchasing raffle tickets, throw a raffle ticket into your bundle. You know everybody, though, is buying a wine wall ticket. Throwing in that raffle is an easy add-on. To get some more engagement there and that might help to make more traction. I would say whatever you do, make sure that you also include donations into your bundles or tax receivable portion in there as well. Because again, the whole goal at the end of the day for you is to raise more for your organization and donations are the ultimate way to do that. It's straight value for your organization. Include some donations, but I would take a look at where do you typically make the most money with your fundraiser? What are the elements that drive the most dollars? What are the ones that don't, but have the potential to, and how can you bundle those two together? Okay, so our next question is about the automated reminders that you talked about for auctions. So are they just for in-person auctions, or how does that work? No, that is going to be for all auctions on the platform. So you can do that for silent and live auctions. I think Trellis might be a platform that's doing that right now. So the idea is that when your donors are participating in the auction, 
they'll get a prompt that says, hey, if you don't win this item, do you want to make it a donation instead? They can keep updating what that donation amount is as they continue to bid on these items. But when the auction ends, if the person that doesn't win has a donation option instead, we can automatically process that payment for you, send them a tax receipt and get it all done at the same time. So it's a super easy way for people to engage. As an organization, you don't have to do a thing. You literally just make sure that checkbox is there for all the items and you're good to go. But we're really excited about it. I know a lot of organizations are saying we're coming to Trellis to try it because it could be a really great way for you to increase the amount of to raise. Yeah, I love that. That's such a simple way. Just checking a box and you have so much potential to raise so much more. So you talked about the nation upsells. How easy are they to set up? Can you just speak to that a little bit? Yeah, definitely. So again, I always say give yourself about 10 minutes, which in the scheme of things is not much time at all. You would say, I would say 10 minutes, you can have your, wow, I'm like losing a word that I'm trying to say. 10 minutes, add in an engaging image, talk about the impact and have that image really highlight the impact that your dollars can make. I would say include a description, talk about the why around what you're doing. Talk about the impacts that me as a donor can have by choosing to give. A $10 donation means that I can provide a meal for a child at school for two days this week. Or a $50 donation means I can help my local food bank provide meals for a family for the night. Whatever that looks like, get really tangible about those amounts. And then choose some donation amounts that you think are going to resonate with your donors. Doing just that alone, giving people some options, some pictures, and some descriptions are going to be all that you need to set up those donations and add that donation augmented piece to your fundraisers. Amazing. And I just have two questions left here. So if anybody has any more questions before we end, make sure you drop them in the chat now so we can get to them. But Rebecca, how do you determine the right ticket price and donation levels? Yeah, with ticket price, again, going to sound like a bit of a cop out, but I'm going to say it really depends. I would think about the value that people are going to receive by attending your fundraiser. And once you know the value, then you can think about what's going to be the best option for your organization in terms of pricing for tickets. If you have never done an event before with this organization, I would take a look at what other organizations have been charging for events similar to yours in your community. And what's selling out? What are people buying and what's resonating with people? If you've done fundraisers in the past or event ticketed fundraisers, take a look at those. What ticket packages were the most popular? What feedback did you get then? And how can you implement that as well? Same thing with donations, right? So take a look at how much have you made in donations in the past. If you've got an option for donations on the website or on your like existing website, which donation option was the most popular? How much do you typically see? Use that as well which you should be asking for as well. I see that there is another question that just popped into chat around assisting with filling any required documents with the state to register for raffles. Absolutely. So I know there is a lot of paperwork. So if you're in the States, we can help you with that. Or if you're in Canada too, we can help you with that as well. Provide you with the recommended doc or the required documentation that you need to make sure that your raffles just fits more seamless on that end. Amazing. And that leads perfectly up to my last question, as it's also about raffles. What is the optimum duration for a raffle? Is a longer selling period always better or do you recommend, because there's something you recommend? Yeah. So with raffles, I always recommend two to four weeks is actually going to be your sweet spot. So two to four weeks gives you a lot of time to get some excitement, get people engaged, get people giving and also participating in this raffle. Your first half of that, so let's assume it's a four-week raffle, just for the sake of this example. The first two weeks of that raffle is all about awareness. Get it out in front of as many people as humanly possible. Maybe you've got some partners you can partner with as well. They can promote it on your behalf. Have it in your newsletters, your social media, wherever you can to get as many people aware of it as possible. The second two weeks are going to be all about encouraging for repeat or in return dollars for raffle ticket sales. So if somebody maybe bought a ticket in the first week, encourage them to come back in the very last week and continue to give again to increase their chance now that the pot size has increased. We find that if you get into like more than a month long, it's really hard to keep talking about the raffle because you're like, I'm just really, it just feels repetitive for you as an organization. And so the two to four weeks, you've got enough time to build hype and get the excitement going. People have enough time to buy, but it's not too long that it feels too repetitive. Gotcha. And I'll hand it back to you too to wrap it up. Rebecca, thank you so much. It's always such a delight to have a repeat guest expert come here and share the wisdom, 
these best practices. And I think you've really given us a lot to think about, and we're going to both freak out about it a little bit and also go back and be really excited because there's so many great opportunities.